Thank you, sir. We're doing a series at the beginning of this year about revisiting the church. And as people visit the average church, particularly in the West, what they see as Christianity, what they see with their eyes that churches do. And we try to reevaluate what churches do generally based on the, the perspective of the Bible rightly divided from mid-Acts Pauline right divided perspective uh, to see whether or not what churches have been doing and what they're doing uh, culturally is what the Bible should prescribe that they do. And so that's what we've been doing over the weeks, dealing with tithing, dealing with worship, uh, dealing with confession. Last week we dealt with the actual sermon, which is something you find in all churches. All these things, I'm trying to, to find a common denominator between all churches, a common elements. They may differ in, in the, the implementation of them or the style of them, but they all have these common elements. Uh, they all have worship. They all have a sanctuary. They all have a priest. They all have confession one way or another through prayers. They, they all have a, a sense of tithing or giving and and they all have sermons, and we dealt with that last week and how preaching sermons actually has a doctrinal origin to them and a purpose for it. And if it's not to give understanding, then you're not really doing sermons right according to the scripture. And so we dealt with that last week, gave examples of, of what people miss uh, from wrong teaching and preaching. And this week I'd like to cover the controversial issue of baptism, Christian baptism, as something that is common among churches worldwide. You do not find a Christian church, in fact, you may not even find some other religions without an initiatory rite uh, or even a water ritual. Uh, so it's interesting, it's a very common religious practice, but particularly in Christianity. Baptism is associated with a Christian initiatory rite. Um, every religion, religion, every special secret group has their initiation ceremonies. And water baptism is the one you see in churches. It's one that most people are quick to grab because unlike other ordinances and sacraments that require, say, lifetime commitments like marriage or holy orders or ongoing spiritual uh, you know, introspection like confession, baptism, once and done. So you get it done out of the way, you've done God's service, and it makes you a Christian according to the traditional thinking of it. And so apart from church attendance, generally speaking, you People identify themselves as Christian in a public act of baptism. That's what they think makes them Christian. And this is not by accident. This is actually by definition by many churches. And so, uh, again, people ask, are you a Christian or not? And they'll think, well, am I or not? And apart from knowing the gospel, which is truly what makes you one, they'll think, well, have I gone to church? I, was I raised in a Christian home, meaning did I attend church? Or was I baptized? A common response to the question, are you saved, is, I was baptized. Or are you a Christian, is, I was baptized. Because people think that being baptized is what it means to become Christian. In fact, you see this all over the celebrity world as well, as Christianity becomes, what, less uncool? I don't know how it's happening now, where Christianity is now the rebel thing to be, like it is in Eastern countries. But if you're Christian, get baptized. And so you see more and more celebrities getting baptized. Just recently, Hulk Hogan a childhood hero of mine, got water baptized. Not really, but <laughs> you really got water baptized. Not really my hero. But Hulk, Hulk Hogan got water baptized with him and his wife in a Baptist church uh, in, in America. And um, he rose out of the water, and he, ex he Instagrammed it, and he said, it was my total surrender and dedication to Jesus, the greatest day of my life. And I'm going, really? Like, what did you believe in when, sir? Yeah. Uh, I hope the man is saved. He seems sincere enough, but sincerity isn't what saves you. It's the work of Jesus Christ, and it's what he's done. He testifies of, of knowing of Jesus and knowing Jesus are two different things. Knowing of Jesus, you know, hearing of him, and knowing him are different things. I agree. I agree on that. So uh, I hope that he's saved. I couldn't tell from his Instagram and his water baptism. But this is what people think is your initiatory right into Christianity. If you've been water baptized, you are now Christian. Kim Kardashian and her daughters, water baptized in an Armenian Orthodox church. What does that mean? They're Christian. Uh, really? Um, that, that's what it's seen as. Justin Bieber and his wife, water baptized in a lake. What's that mean? He's Christian, right? Uh, really? Um, Russell Crowe and his child, water baptized. You know, these are celebrities. It always makes the news when celebrities get water baptized, right? Because if a celebrity gets water baptized, if a celebrity is in your church, that's what we need here. We're not growing very fast. We need more celebrities. If we had celebrities, then that would give more credence to what we're doing, right? Rob Schneider, SNL fame. Water uh, baptized Catholic, right? Or Lecrae, if you like that type of music, uh, water baptized. This is, this, happens over, this is just recent celebrity baptisms is all I, I looked up here on Google. 
But it happens frequently where people get water baptized, and this is seen as a public testimony or a confession or the act of, initiatory right of becoming Christian to various degrees and explanations. It's seen as a surrendering of your life. You can believe certain things, but when you get water baptized, you're now consecrated, you're dedicated, you're initiated, you're identified with Christianity. Make a commitment. Right? So if you haven't made a commitment this morning and you want to be water baptized, fill out the form in the pew, put it in the back, and we'll schedule a time, right? It's your, some people describe it as the first act of obedience, because Mark and Matthew talk about belief and baptism. So you believe, and what's next? So what do I do after I believe? Be baptized. Right? That's the second thing you do. That's the first thing you do after you believe. It's the first act of obedience. People describe it as the admission to the church, like to the church, which raises all sorts of questions. Like, what church? Like, this church? Like, this assembly here of people? Or, like, the denomination? Or, like, God's church? Like, which church is it? What is the church, after all? Well, that requires some study, but after baptism, <laughs> we'll baptize you first. In non-Catholic denominations or Protestant denominations, it's one of the two sacred ordinances that... Apparently, God has bestowed upon the church. Um, it's two that remain from the original seven sacraments that the Roman Catholic Church still holds as parts of the sacraments of grace in, in their church. The other five, including confession, which we've already covered, holy orders and marriage, which you can't do at the same time, yeah. and uh, you know, anointing and things like that. It's also, some of you may be familiar with the idea, you say Catholics, they, they don't water baptize, like dunk in water. And they don't. They don't do that. They they have a, a sprinkling and a kind of a washing type of service, that type of thing. Um, some of you may be aware of the, the name of christening. You've heard of christening, which came from the Christian religious ceremony of water baptism. Christening means, and you look up the dictionary, ceremony of baptism, a naming or dedication or initiation into Christianity. Right? That's what christening is. And of course, you take a baby to their christening, and they get their Christian name, right? And they get water baptized, sprinkled, uh, by the priest in a christening. So it's very interesting, that idea of christening or becoming as Christ, which is what the word means, is initiated to Christianity. So baptism is universally accepted, whether you sprinkle, whether you pour, whether you dunk, whether you drink, you're, or don't drink, don't drink in the baptistry. Uh, everybody is water baptized, it seems like. And everyone agrees on that you have to be water baptized, except for a few small sects. Uh, everyone usually accepts it, except for they don't agree on these things. They don't agree on the questions of who gets water baptized. Big disagreement on this. Is it believer's baptism? Is it for infants as well? Can your whole house be baptized? Right? Can you be baptized before you actually understand the doctrines about the gospel? Who is it that's baptized? Or what is baptism? Like, is it immersion? Is it sprinkling? Is it from a distance? <laughs> is it with the with the, 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 you know, the spray of the, the whip or something? Is it, how do you do it? Is it the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Is it, you say that three times, one time? Is it the name of the God? How do you say the name? What do you say when they're going down? What do you say when you come up? How do you do it? Is, and why are you doing it? Which is the most significant reason yeah. or question that people debate over is why water baptism is necessary. Some people just leave it to mystery. Charles Spurgeon did that, and he just said, well, even if you don't know why, it doesn't matter. Christ commanded it, right? Which... If God commanded us to do something, it is not for his servants to ask why. We should just obey. But why is a common disagreement? Some people say it's for salvation, right? That's actually a common explanation of water baptism. Some say it's not for salvation. It's just for your admission to the church, like God's church. Some will say, well, it's not for salvation or the church identification. In fact, it doesn't give you uh, any position in Christ, but it is a public testimony. It's a, mis a ministry to others. Or they'll say that it's a symbol of a spiritual reality, right? Or some will simply say, it's tradition. Why? We've always done it. Which seems to be more and more, as time goes on, a reason for doing lots of things in churches. It's tradition without scriptural confidence. And so, that's Christian baptism for you. A universal element that people see as part of Christianity. Everyone sees it, especially when you post on Instagram that you've done it. And yet no one understands why water just agrees on the hows and the winds and the whos. So I want to revisit this or look at this dispensationally, uh, specifically at the baptismal font, at the idea of using water in baptism. Because it may shock some of you, maybe not others, that I'm not going to end up saying that baptism is wrong. It's not wrong. Baptism is right. 
I'm going to question the baptismal font, Amen. the use of water in your baptism, Amen. right? Because baptism is a biblical idea and concept, it's a thing taught by Paul frequently. But water, where is that exactly? Is that necessary? It's this issue more than some of the others. As we've gone through this series, some of these other lessons, there's been many other Christian groups and people that you may say, well, I know Christians that agree with you on that or agree with the scripture on this, either about worship and the excesses there or, or the wrong ways of preaching sermons or even confessions. Well, there was a whole Reformation thought about that. But when it comes to this issue of water baptism, this seems to be the issue where all others draw the line with us since our baptism is not wet. Right, that's it. It wouldn't matter necessarily how we do it or who we do it with. There'd be the common arguments about that. But when we say, don't need the water, they go, wait a minute. Every Christian agrees that water is there in baptism, right? And so this seems to be an issue, a barrier to many people to the perspective of the Bible rightly divided from a mid experts Pauline perspective, being Pauline with the scripture, is that you don't water baptize? You don't water, that. you don't need water? We came into the building, here's a big old tub where they water baptized, and we took it out and cut it up and put it in the trash, and we didn't need it. We turned it into a kitchen. And uh, <laughs> that, that, that could be offensive to people. They say, why would you do that? Because the water isn't special. It came from a pipe in the ground, the same water you drink out of over there. And, uh, and so it wasn't the water at all. And, and, and more important than that, there's not an instruction for us in the Scripture, when rightly divided, to do that. Amen. Right? Uh, and that's the part where people disagree with. So... When we remove the water, we seem to be creating a barrier here. In fact, baptism itself becomes a barrier for people, literally, to enter into the church or even in the church to enter certain places in the church. The way churches define baptism, the way they sanctify baptism as a sac sacrament and ordinance, separates. That's part of the description of the function of baptism in Christian history, is that it separates those who are not Christians from those that are. are. I know who are and who isn't. Well, I've been baptized. Right? Yes. A true Christian baptism? By whom? <laughs> you know, the Presbyterians, the Catholics, you know, the, these guys. Well, that's not a real baptism, or that's not the right way, or, okay, you have been, but that's how you know if you are Christian or not, apparently. It's how you identify if you've been water baptized. What's interesting about that is since you only get baptized once, presumably, even though I can probably ask many of you, I've already asked a couple this morning, you've been baptized more than once in your life. And that's because if I ask you've been baptized, I have to take your word for it which is why Christians for a long time had certificates, like a license that proved that you were baptized because I have to believe you when you say you were baptized because it's not something I can see on your face still, right? You, know, you were wet when you got baptized. And so there's, there's this literal burial, barrier in Christian religion of being in, initiated into it, of water baptism. So what does it mean? Because if it is the initiation, is that how you get in? Then don't you want to be in? You want to be saved. You want to be Christian. You want to get eternal life through Christ. If there is a gateway in, I want to go through the gate, right? I want to get in. I want to get glory. I don't want to leave. So what is it? Well, let's ask Webster before we get to the scripture here. Noah Webster, 1828 Dictionary, defines baptism as the application of water to a person. Wow, <laughs> there it is. That settles the argument, right? Baptism. Of course, this is Noah Webster, not the Bible, which we'll see later why it's important to get your definitions from the Bible, especially concerning controversial issues, uh, because even dictionaries can be influenced by the culture of the day. But meanwhile, it says, baptism is defined as the application of water to a person as a sacrament or religious ceremony by which he is initiated into the visible church of Christ. This is usually performed by sprinkling or immersion. Now, that definition would not be disputed by a majority of Christians, except the one you see in front of you this morning, Amen. because I object to the water and the religious ceremony and the initiation of the visible church through the water, right? However, take out the water from that definition, take out the religion and the sacrament, and you know what? I believe baptism does put me into Christ Amen. and does put me into the church, and baptism does save me. Don't clip that on YouTube and put it somewhere else. <laughs> baptism saves me because my baptism is into the only one that can save me, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. And water can't. And so there's a barrier that's been created by religion and by church history and by, quite frankly, a misunderstanding of what baptism is to, to I think, confuse so many people about the reality of the gospel that saves them. 
we were talking about that this morning. And the problem with water is not necessarily that when you touch it, you get tainted with sin that you go to hell. That's not the issue with the water. The issue is that when people think that the water baptism was what makes you a Christian, they stop trusting the cross, or rather, it's hidden behind the symbolism or hidden behind the sacrament that they think what made them Christian was the act and not whatever it is you explained it to be. People administering it might know one thing, and the people receiving and partaking of it think something entirely different. And you see that by the evidence of so many people thinking that the day they were water baptized and that event is what made them Christian. It's what brought them into Christianity. They don't read the nuances of the catechism or the Presbyterian Westminster Confession of Faith and say, oh, you mean I was in the church before I was water baptized? Which is actually what they say, but not actually what they communicate by their actions, which means they're hiding something. Rather, you just testify the gospel clearly so people know how you get saved, but Baptism, the definition itself contains water in the dictionary. Baptistries contain, a baptistry is actually a room or a special place in a church that contains a font. Maybe you don't know what that word means. You've maybe sung at some hymnals without knowing what it is. That means, have uh, you seen those little things you go to a Catholic church, a Lutheran church, something like that? It's like a stand with like a bird bath on the top, right? Like a bowl with water, right? It's a baptismal font. Some are bigger than others, and that's where you would sprinkle and baptize people, or pour and baptize people through the baptismal font. Font means a source of, of water, primarily, or, or life, a spring, a source of life, like the word fountain, right? That's where it comes from. And so you hear many hymns talk about a font or a fountain. And uh, unless it specifies a font or fountain of blood, which some songs do, you got to wonder, why are they singing about the font and the fountain? Because there's a lot of baptismal fonts where people teach that you have to be water baptized to be saved. But it's either a font or a tank in Baptist denominations being identified by baptism, meaning immersion. Um, they would have a tank size place where people could be completely immersed in water. Uh, it fulfilled the definition of baptism there. But it's where priests, a baptistry is a font or a tank where priests administer the water sacrament. That's where it is. So churches would have a baptistry. So going to a church and saying, where's your baptistry? Or how do you baptize? Is a very common religious question. They'll either show you the font or they'll show you the tank. And to go to a church and say there is none, what do you do? Is there a river nearby? People do that. You know, what, what, what do you do with baptism? Actually, look at Exodus 29, verse 4. Water baptism, all Christian water baptism, as is practiced in churches worldwide, is taken historically from Israel's water baptism. Now, if you did not know that so-called Christian water baptism was taken from Israel's Jewish water baptism, then let me explain to you from the Bible where that comes from. Jews water baptize. They don't use the word baptize. They use the word mikvah as a place for which they would immerse themselves in water. And there's other washing instruments that they use. But Jews had all sorts of washings and all sorts of what you would call baptisms, okay, regarding their people for purity and conversion and dedication. They did it all the time. They did it throughout their life. Women did it more than men, right? There are many reasons for that. But it was Jewish. It was a common thing you would do in Jewish law. And so in Matthew, Luke, and John, when Jesus came preaching the kingdom at hand, and John the Baptist was water baptizing, and Jesus was water baptizing, they were continuing the Jewish religious rules regarding purification and conversion. Okay? And so every Christian church that does it today is continuing that practice from Jewish law. Exodus 29, verse 3 and 4. It's talking here about dedication and consecration of the priests in Israel's temple. This was the giving of the law. It says, take Aaron, and we covered the priests in a previous lesson, and take some oil and take some, uh, some animals here, you're going to sacrifice them. And in verse 24, Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring into the door of the tabernacle. Don't enter into the tabernacle. Bring them to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before he enters in. And wash them with water. You cannot enter into the holy place unless you're washed with water. In fact, in the law elsewhere, it would actually have a laver, like an actually bowl of water where they would wash the sacrifices and the priests would wash themselves because they could not operate in the temple without being washed with water, being ritualistically pure and clean. Now, the Jewish washings back here were not like your daily bath. Okay, don't, I'm teaching Jewish law here, okay? This, was, this is not like your daily bath and, and shower and whatnot. This was not like, I'm filthy today, I need to go to the laver and wash. You could not actually wash in these sacred 
instruments, the labor and all that, unless you were already bathed from dirt, right? This was ritual. This was religious requirement. This was spiritual. So it was a physical act indicating a spiritual reality of their cleanliness. That's what this was. In the same way Christians today describe it as a physical act that identifies a spiritual reality. It's the same meaning the Jews had. There's no difference. The next one, verse 4, the priests here had to wash themselves with water. And it's from these washings, that being an example of it, that all water baptism of Christianity is taken from in the scripture and historically speaking. Without washing in a mikvah, without washing, Jews could not, even to this day, ask a Jew, go to askajew.com or something, you know, you say, what about mikvahs? Make sure it's one who's scriptural, meaning they're orthodox, not those who deny their scripture like some Christians do. But they'll say, yeah, we have mikvahs. Even today in their synagogues, they have mikvahs. Uh, and if we had a temple, they would say, and if we had sacrificial system, we could not enter our temple or offer sacrifices unless first we had gone through the mikvah, unless first we were spiritually and ritualistically clean. We could not offer sacrifices. Now, everyone had to offer sacrifices, and everyone had to access the temple at one point or another, and you could not do that without a washing, a water baptism, right? Now, these water baptisms were frequent, right? Just like your offerings and sacrifices were frequent. And what does Hebrews tell you about Jesus' sacrifice, replacing the frequent sacrifices, right? So and this is where Christians teach that you don't need water baptized many times, just once. So the Jews are going, what? Once? Yes, we're Christians, baptized once, but baptized once and you're done unless you switch denominations and you get baptized again, but you know. But this is the idea of Jewish baptism. A Jew couldn't access the holy places. Um, there were many times in life a Jew would be water baptized, especially if they had their temple in place, but um, some of them were monthly. Right? You baptize every month. Jesus commanded baptism. Look at Matthew 28. I told you there's a barrier between people and Midax right division based on this issue. There's a barrier because the dictionary defines it as water application. Every church has a baptistry, it seems like. There's a traditional barrier. Even the Jews do it. Well, that's interesting. And Jesus commanded it. He commanded water baptism. If God commands us to do something, we should do it. If God does not command us to do something, in fact, commands us not to do something, we should not do it. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus says, Go ye therefore, and by the way, I'll address this here, that this is the, I think one of the couple times that Jesus commands baptism. There's very few places that baptism is actually instructed. There's a reason why Matthew 28, verse 19, the only time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those commissions, that baptism is actually instructed, is in Matthew 28, verse 19. The Luke commission doesn't include it. The John commission doesn't include it. The Acts 1 commission doesn't include it. And Mark 16 only includes it as an after effect of your belief. But here's the only place in those four commissions where Jesus actually commands baptism. And he says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. See the instruction? Go baptize them, which is why the description or the, the, the justification for all water baptism in Christianity comes from Matthew 28, verse 19, and this instruction from Jesus. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thus you see the prescription of how to do it. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you. The second part sometimes is left off at the command. Sometimes this whole so-called great commission is reduced down to simply go. right? But sometimes I'd go and make disciples. The more baptismal oriented will say, go and make disciples, or teach all nations, baptizing them. Which is what he said. If you want to be more scriptural, you have to include the whole commission, which is baptizing them in the name of and teaching them to observe all the things that I commanded you. Right? He commanded baptism. Jesus also commanded, look at Matthew 5, verse 19. He also commanded to do the law of Moses. Now, based on what I just told you about water baptism in the Old Testament, that should not be a shock. So already I'm trying to show you here that we're trying to find out biblically. We're trying to look at the Bible and what water baptism has to do with Christianity. John the Baptist came baptizing in water in the River Jordan. Jesus and his disciples came baptizing. And then after he died and rose from the dead, he commanded his disciples to go to teach all nations, baptizing them. The Jews water baptized frequently as conversion practices. Why wouldn't we do it? 
Well, if that's all the Bible we had, we should. But if that's all the Bible we had, then we have a question about what the gospel is and who we are in Christ. Because we also don't hear from these same passages in Matthew what the church of the body of Christ is or the gospel preaching of the cross. But Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments, these least commandments of the law, in verse 18, not one jot or tittle shall pass, no wise pass from the law to all people fulfilled. And they shall teach men so. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Well, there you go. You should obey what Jesus said. Yes, and what Jesus said is do every law, even the least jot and tittle. Well, he didn't mean all the laws. He meant that the, there's no jot or tittle of the law. Whoever shall, he means the moral ones, the big ones, shall break the least of these commandments. He didn't say sum up the big ones. Here he says, even the least of them, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the least of the commandments, not the greatest, the least, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Jesus taught the law of Moses. He did not come to destroy the law of Moses. He came to fulfill it, Matthew 5, verse 17 says. Look at Matthew 8, verse 4. Matthew 8, verse 4. Jesus heals a man. A leper comes to him. He worshiped the Lord. He says, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. Jesus says, I will, be thou clean. And he was cleansed. Matthew 8, verse 4, Jesus says unto him, See thou tell no man. Well, that's interesting. Everyone who gets healed seems to tell everyone else. But Jesus says, Tell no man, but go thy way. Show thyself to the priest. Well, isn't Jesus the high priest? Jesus says, go to the priest, over there, to the priest. He doesn't say, forget about that guy. I am your priest. He says, go to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony to them. Is J Jesus subjecting himself to the law of Moses? Yes, he is. Amen. Right? He gave the law to Moses, but he's saying, do the law of Moses. He came, born under the law, teaching the law, to Israel, who was given the law to do. Matthew 8, verse 4. Look at Matthew 23. So that's early in his ministry. He must have changed his tune by the end. Matthew 23 is right towards the end here. Jesus, to the multitude and to his disciples, said this. Matthew 23, 2. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in, not my seat, he says Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe. Now, did the Pharisees and scribes, the Pharisees, you know the Pharisees, self-righteous Pharisees as they were, did they have the practice of skipping over some laws because, you know, you don't have to do that one? They taught all the law to the detail, so much so they added some to it so that you had to do even more. Jesus rebuked them for that. But he says, whatsoever they bid you, observe. That observe and do. Do the law of Moses, but do not ye after their works, for they are hypocrites. They say and they don't do. So they're teaching, but they don't do it. Don't be like that. But do what they teach. He says, do what Moses says. Jesus says it frequently in his earthly ministry, especially in the book of Matthew. So it would not be a coincidence that Matthew 28, Jesus says, go and water baptize them and teach them everything I commanded you, which would seem to include doing the law of Moses. So be careful, Christian, who wants to take Matthew 28 as your instruction, because it also includes Matthew 5 and Matthew 8 and Matthew 23, just as well as Matthew 6 and Matthew 7, right, and Matthew 13, which Christians love. So we got an issue here, how to rightly divide the scripture. Where are our instructions? Where are we found? Is Jesus instructing us? Who was he speaking to? He was speaking to his kingdom disciples, those who, whom he gave kingdom authority over the nation of Israel. That's what Matthew 28 is talking about. But see, there's a barrier here because who doesn't agree that Matthew 28 is the great commission for the church? You see, this baptism thing goes deep. This is why, even though it's in one sense the easiest thing to explain to people, we'll see a little bit later here, it's actually very easy to show that there's more than one baptism, there's baptisms that are dry, and our baptism is not wet. It's very easy to show this from Scripture, but it's the hardest to swallow because there's tradition, there's definition, there's architecture, there's Jesus' command, there's great commissions on our banners. It's like, it's right there, don't you know? But then you could just easily show the Scripture, but it depends on people's wanting to believe the scripture, or everything else. And that's very hard, folks. I understand that. It's very hard to let God be true, which everyone wants to agree with, but to let God be true when every other person is a liar, every man's a liar. That's the hard part. 
It's not too hard to say, yeah, of course God's true, he's God. But if he's true, that means they're all wrong. That's the hard part. It doesn't require everyone to be wrong, it's just that's what the verse says. That means if it means everyone is wrong, then so be it. I mean, that's what the verse says. That's really the hard part. We don't like to say that about ourselves, about others. We don't want to admit that. So it's a very difficult and controversial issue that we're visiting this morning. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, surely people don't make a big deal about baptism. I mean, the church tradition you may have came from or that I may have came from, they say, we didn't consider it salvatory. It was just a, a public testimony and profession of inward belief, you know, that type of thing. It wasn't really that serious. Let me read to you uh, some of the more serious historical statements of faith from different denominations that span the doctrinal spectrum here. Okay, the Westminster Confession, which includes most Reformed Presbyterian, things like that. Westminster Confession, chapter 28 of baptism. Baptism is a sacrament of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ, quoting Matthew 28. Not only for the solemn admission of the party baptized into the visible church, but also to be unto him a sign and seal of the covenant of grace. Your seal of grace is water baptism. It's also his engrafting into Christ. How you get into Christ is by baptism. Of regeneration, you're regenerated by baptism. Of your remission of sins by baptism. Now these are Presbyterians, okay? And of his giving up unto God through Jesus Christ to walk in this of life is by baptism. Which sacrament is by Christ's own appointment to be continued in his church until the end of the world. Now, how is that to be performed? The outward element to be used in this sacrament is water. Water baptism does all that. That's what the Westminster Confession says. Well, I'm not Presbyterian, you say I'm Baptist. All right. Baptist Confession, 1689. Baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ to be under the party baptized, a sign of his fellowship with him. A sign of your fellowship with Christ is baptism. In his death and resurrection, of his being engrafted into Christ, of remission of sins, and of giving up unto God through Jesus Christ, they copied from the Westminsters, you know. To live and walk in newness of life, right? And it's for those who do actually profess repentance. So this is the difference there. You actually have to believe to be bought or baptized. You can't be a child. Westminster said that. But it also required water. The outward element to be used in water is water. Paragraph four is by immersion. That's the big dispute. It's not paragraph one or two, which is what it does and the water. It's paragraph three and four. Who does it? And is it immersion or is it sprinkling and pouring? The Methodist Articles of Religion, 1784. Baptism is not only a sign of profession and mark of difference, whereby Christians are distinguished from others that are not baptized, but it is also a sign of regeneration or the new birth. The baptism of young children is to be retained. The Roman Catholic Catechism, second edition. Holy baptism is the basis of the whole Christian life, the gateway of life in the Spirit, the door which gives access to other sacraments. Through baptism, we are freed from sin, reborn as sons of God. We have become members of Christ, are incorporated into the church, and made shares in our mission. That's not too far off from the Presbyterians or the Baptists. This sacrament is also called the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. It signifies and actually brings about the birth of water and spirit, which, by which no one can enter the kingdom of God without. By baptism, all sins are forgiven. Original sin, personal sins, punishment for sin. There's not too much difference in what baptism does. The disagreement here among these three statements of faith is how they did it and who they did it to. They seem to all agree that Jesus commanded that you water baptize and it's needed for salvation in some way, if not your identification with the church. Now, this is interesting because that, that's not, baptism wasn't the issue the Reformation was fought over. It was something else. That's why they were so simil similar here. Charles Spurgeon of the 19th century, Prince of Preachers, didn't do much to clarify the issue of baptism. He says, what connection has this baptism with faith? I think it has just this. Baptism is the avowal of faith, the commitment of faith, a testimony of faith, an obedient act of faith, and a refreshment to faith. You say, excuse me, Prince of Preachers? Refreshment of faith? What is that exactly? Let me explain. Let him explain. While we are made up of body and soul as we are, we shall need some means by which the body shall sometimes be stirred up to co-work with the soul. Oh, really? So my belief must co-work with my body to receive what baptism gives us. He ends up explaining this uh, symbol of the physical reality in a spiritual way and thus says, 
Explain baptism thus, dear friends. There's no fear of popery rising out of it. Why? Because it sounds much like the Pope. <laughs> Explain it thus, and we cannot suppose any soul will be led to trust to it. As long as you do the act of water baptism and just explain it that way, no one will trust the act. But why does he keep the act? Because he thinks Jesus commanded it, and he has to obey the Lord, and I agree. I mean, that's sincere motivation. Right? And so this is the testimony of church history about water baptism. So we're treading on sensitive grounds here. Quite literally, maybe treading on sensitive waters because... Um, baptism is universally accepted as being instructed by the Lord as water and thus also including Paul's epistles necessary for salvation because baptism, by Webster's definition, requires water be applied to a person. Right? So water baptism is a mystery that we don't quite understand because it seems like you're doing a work, but we know it's not a work. So that's what Paul said. Hmm. Okay. A work that's not a work. This is where we're left, in a state of confusion about baptism. And so we leave it to usually just, let's just obey God. And sometimes Christians, in their lack of wanting to wrestle honestly with historical theological questions, and I totally confess that's a, a, a resort that you could rightly fall into, just saying, I, I don't want to mess with the convoluted logic here. I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't have the brain power. You say, I'm just going to cover my bases. Let's do it. <laughs> What's the harm, right? Either get into heaven or not. Yes, indeed. And so, thus tradition is created and perpetuated. I would rather give you the faith in what God has given you to believe for your salvation so you know confidently what saves you and what does not. You know confidently how to communicate and publicly testify that faith and not do it from, through some symbol that doesn't publicly testify your faith. Right? If you're trying to create ministers and soldiers and workmen, they must be equipped to understand what makes them Christian in the first place. And that is not by water baptism. Let's cover a few of the reasons people get for water baptism here, as I just read a few of them in these statements of faith here, these confessions. Before we do that, I just want to make the, the point that any conflation, any combination of water baptism with your salvation or with your identity is a failure, a result of a failure to rightly divide. That's, that's going to end up being the, the problem here. This is why... The Bible right division can enlighten your understanding. And one of the first things it does enlighten your understanding, too, is this. Because it's so easy to see if Scripture rightly divided. It's simply so hard to accept by tradition. The idea that baptism saves, which we saw many times in the historical confessions, okay, that it actually saves. You can find scriptural support for Mark 16, 16. Mark says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. So... Obviously, the next verse says it's not about the baptism. It's about the belief first, but baptism follows it. Right? But it's for salvation. Acts 2.38, Peter stands up after being asked, what shall we do when he preached that you killed your Messiah? He said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. You receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, without the Holy Ghost, you're not Christ, and you've got to get the Holy Ghost, and you can't get the Holy Ghost until you're water baptized, and you can't. That's what Peter said. What about Acts 22.16, when Paul himself, was saved on the road to Damascus. Three days later, Ananias comes to him and says, be water baptized and wash away your sins. Remember Acts 22, 16? Oh, my sins washed away. So did Constantine. So the legend goes that he waited as long as possible until he thought he was going to croak and then <laughs> get the final dunk, you know, and get to wash them all. It saves a lot of confessions that way, you know. Get the giant eraser. Acts 22, verse 16. But if water baptism is what removes your sins and is what makes your salvation, then wouldn't that not require your work? To which the religionist says, not if the priest does it. <laughs> yeah, but it's not the work of Christ. Amen. Right? In Romans 4 verse 5, Paul says to him that worketh not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, not his baptism into water. Ephesians 2, 9 even guards against the idea, saying, you're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't post a picture of you having faith on Instagram. Try that. They'd be like, what? What is that? Like, your ugly mug? It's like, no, that's me having faith. But you can definitely post a picture of your baptism on Instagram. I've seen Hulk Hogan's. Yeah, there it is. Like, wow, what an amazing turnaround from his 
wrestling days. Meanwhile, it, people say water baptism replaces circumcision. Now, these are the more, again, these are the reasons given in the confessions and in churches that most people don't really understand or accept, but it saves. Another reason is that it replaces circumcision. At one point, God required circumcision, physical circumcision, a physical act, which the physical act did nothing actually to save these people at all, but it was an act, a token, a sign of their entrance into the covenant of God. And so they say water baptism is the New Testament sign into the new covenant of God with his covenant people. And so they say circumcision was replaced with water baptism, putting you into God's covenant. You need to be in God's covenant to get salvation in Christ and all that. Well, what about Ephesians 2, 15 through 18? What, what if you don't need a covenant to be saved? See, now we're hitting another string of sensitive people. What do you mean you don't need a covenant to be saved? What if I'm saved by Christ Amen. without a covenant? Where everyone had a covenant. What if all the covenants were given to Israel, as the Bible says? What if Ephesians 2, verse 12 says that I was strangers of the covenants of promise? Like, I, I, I didn't have the covenants. They were given to me. They are given to Israel. But now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus, you, that's me, who sometimes were far off because I was a stranger with the covenant, are made nigh by not another covenant, but by the blood of Christ. For he, not the covenant, Christ, is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition. And what separated me as a Gentile from those Jews over there? Covenants, circumcision, contracts, agreements. He broke them down, the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances to make himself of twain, of two, one new man, so making peace. What if, verse 18, for through him, that's Christ, we both, Jew and Gentile, we all, all of us, have access by one spirit, God's spirit, unto the Father. There's the Father, Son, and Spirit, one verse, but our access, you see, to God is not through a covenant, it's through Christ. Amen. That's the answer. Yes, yes, but Christ is the covenant. No, no, Christ is the person. Christ is the second person of the Godhead. A covenant is something God makes. Yeah. Right? If I'm getting them through Christ, it doesn't matter to me the contract, especially if that Christ says you're now a part of my body. Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah. Right? Baptized by the Spirit through belief. So replacing one covenant with another covenant and using one physical sign, given to Israel, by the way, with another physical sign, given to Israel, by the way, in me who am not Israel, and to Christ without need for a physical sign because I am put into his body by the Spirit. Don't need a covenant. Galatians chapter 5, verse 2. Galatians had the mistake thinking they needed a better covenant, and it wasn't given to them. Galatians 5, 1. Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with a yoke of bondage, like being obligated to a covenant. Right? Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Are we to believe that Paul is saying here, I say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ profits you nothing, but if you be baptized, Christ profits you everything. Done by the same holy man, different act, different covenant. No, no, he's talking about their work, right? I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. You know, water baptism was also in the law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. The law is what you do. Grace is what Christ did. Water baptism is not what Christ does. In fact, you go back to John. Jesus didn't water baptize. It doesn't say anybody there. The disciples did. But apart from that, your baptism is by the Spirit into Christ. There's not a man on earth that baptizes you into Christ. Right? That's not instructed at all. The baptism was performed by John the Baptist by Jesus' disciples, by Peter, was the baptism into Israel's new covenant people, into their kingdom. That's what Jesus taught. But I'm not looking for the kingdom. I'm looking for Christ. How do I get into him? How do I get salvation? So, Galatians 6.15, Paul says, Circumcision avails nothing, nor uncircumcision. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Not a new covenant there. A new creature. New creature and new covenant are different. Okay? What about it making you a member of the church? Water baptism makes you a member of the church. Now, this can be taken different directions. One direction is the, you heard in the statements of faith, the visible church, as opposed to the invisible spiritual church that includes everyone in heaven. But the visible church is what you see here. 
Well, if that be true, then we're talking about what? Denominations? We're talking about just the earthly church? What are we talking about? Makes you a member of the church. By the way, water baptism making you a member of the church said no one who was baptized before Christ's cross, before the church began, before Paul. Paul is the only one in the Bible anywhere that says you're baptized into Christ. He's the only one. Amen. Without Paul's epistles, no one would be saying this, which means everyone water baptized by John the Baptist and by Jesus' earthly ministry, by Peter at Pentecost, none of them, according to the scriptures, said I'm baptized to be a member of the church. They were baptized, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. They were baptized in Acts 2 for the remission of sins. Not enters into a church. This is the problem of trying to take the water baptism of Matthew, Luke, and John, combine it with the spiritual reality of Paul's revelation, and going, like, put them together. Because Paul's the only one in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, says, by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. He's the only one that teaches that. Which brings me to my next point here. Every biblical instruction, every biblical instruction, people say, well, Christ instructed it. He, the Lord instructed water baptism. We saw it in Matthew 28 already. Every biblical instruction to water baptize is from a minister of the circumcision. Every one of them. You can find biblical instructions to water baptize, and every one of them is an instruction from a minister of the circumcision. Yes. You say, well, what's the big deal with that? God had, didn't we just read in Galatians 6.15? In Christ Jesus, circumcision avails nothing. But these weren't just circumcised ministers, like Jewish ministers. They were ministers of the, ministers to Israel. Romans 15, verse 8, Paul says, Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, the truth of God. John the Baptist was a Jewish prophet. Jesus said he was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Why Old Testament? Because the New Testament hadn't come yet. Right? Jesus himself operated under the Old Testament. An act of obedience to what? Matthew 28, 19? Yes, that is the, act, that is the instruction. Like I told you, the sole instruction from Jesus Everywhere else, it's simply a description of what they were doing. It described John baptizing. It described Jesus baptizing. There was no instruction for everyone else until Matthew 28, when Jesus said, go and baptize. Right? That was instruction written down and recorded. But what if Jesus wasn't talking to you? Or what if Jesus said further instructions later that would conflict with his prior? Amen. What are you talking about? It's Matthew 28. It's the end of Matthew. You know Jesus appeared after Matthew 28 and after Acts 1 to instruct people about how to operate. In fact, to instruct them about salvation, instruct them about the church, this new thing he was doing. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. The fact that people don't know this verse exists is why I have to bring it up so often when I talk about baptism. Because Paul was, Christ appeared to Paul and spoke to him subsequent to his ascension to heaven. Folks, not just his resurrection, which is also true. His ascension to heaven. Christians 1 17, Paul says, Christ sent me. Yes, Paul, we know. Christ sent all the apostles to go to teach the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teach them all the commandments. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize. Paul is not talking about Matthew 28, verse 19, in that verse, is he? So, Paul, when did Christ send you? Try Acts 9. Try anywhere after Acts 9, which is where Paul got saved. Okay, but definitely wasn't Matthew 28. So maybe Jesus told Paul the same thing in Acts 9. Well, he can't because Paul is saying the content of the sending of Christ to him was not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Well, I thought the gospel was go and teach all nations, baptizing them. Not according to Paul. Paul says baptism and this is water baptism because of the context that he's talking, you can, you can read it here, is not the preaching of the gospel. Different. But if it's not the preaching of the gospel, then how can baptism, water baptism, save you the way the confessions say? You see the problem here? There's something going on. There's something that has changed from Matthew 28 to 1 Corinthians. An act of obedience? Well, now you've got a conflict. And whose sending are you going to follow? Whose apostleship are you going to obey? Peter's, Matthew's, or Paul's? They both have a message from Christ. Which one do you choose now? It's not simply just Jesus or Paul. It's Jesus through Peter or Jesus through Paul. It's Jesus both ways. 
One has a more recent instruction, by the way. Amen. People say it's a public testimony of your salvation, which again, no one said before anywhere in the Bible, no one said this. No one ever said, find me a verse anywhere that says they're being baptized as a public testimony of their salvation. By the way, this is not the reason why you find historically in archeological sites, ancient baptistry buildings. Now you may be familiar with the baptistry tank on the, on the stage of Baptist churches, or baptismal font in Lutheran churches that's before the altar, that would actually keep you from coming to the altar where you receive the, their communion because you couldn't take that unless you were baptized first, so they'd put it before that, because the entrance as a symbol is entrance to take communion, you had to be water baptized. To receive the bread of life, you'd be water baptized, right? Baptists like to put the cross on top of their baptism, because that's where you contact with the blood, that's where you meet the cross of Christ, the symbol of the cross is underneath the water there, right? But the public testimony of your salvation, they used to have a separate building, like a separate building. It looked kind of like a gazebo in some places, some very ornate structures, historically speaking, okay? That were, that's all they did. It was like a little alcove, smaller than this probably in the room. In the middle they had a font or something, or, some, or a baptistry in there. Very private thing. You know why it was private? You ready for the great reveal here, folks? Because some people, historical documents say Hippolytus, early church fathers, were baptized naked. So, whoa, whoa, back up here. <laughs> well, public testimony, I think not. It was an initiatory rite, folks. It was a conversion practice. Even in Jewish synagogues today, their mikvahs are hidden underneath their synagogue. So when the women go water baptize themselves, it's not public testimony. It's an obedience of their law. Right? Mm. Mm, yeah. Pu this was, public testimony for salvation was invented by Christians. Yeah. As they emphasized, it was needed to be done, and we want to see it. Everyone needs to see it to witness this, because it has to be done. You know, even in Jewish synagogues, they have attendance, these mikvahs, and they don't even watch them do it. They trust them. They just turn around. I mean, they're naked after all. You know, it's, it's, like, it's up to you to keep the law, you know. No one else has to make you keep the law. Even in Jewish law, it was up to you, you and God. So even if it was an act of obedience, it should be up to you. And it should be, that believer's baptism or whatnot, but is water necessary? No, not everyone was baptized naked. And of course, over the centuries, that kind of fell away, thank goodness. You know, but uh, you do see a change of clothes in many places. Right? Sometimes in the Catholic Church, even they'll describe why the clothes change. You put on a white robe for certain reasons and things like that. Reasons that are sometimes not told to you. Just put on the white robe. Read the catechism. That means something to them. Right? But Mormons do baptisms in private. Not for this reason necessarily, but because they're baptizing their neighbors into the church. The Mormon church can bapt water baptize other people into the church, which is interesting. Baptize dead people. Meanwhile, public testimony of your salvation is nowhere found in the scripture. A symbol of a spiritual reality. People say baptism is a physical act or a physical symbol of a spiritual reality. Well, the truth is that it was always hidden. The truth is always hidden behind symbols. Okay, look at Colossians 2, verse 11. Whenever you find a religion or a system that it communicates in symbols, I will find you something called a mystery religion, a hidden truth, a Gnostic truth, something that only experts understand because it's hidden behind secret symbols, which is why our God is not that. He's revealed the mystery. He has spoken in words you can't understand. That was Tyndale's argument when he said, we want a Bible in language of the people because God does not keep things secret from people. He reveals them. We should put it in their language so they can see it and understand it. Not to hide it behind secret symbols and languages they don't know. Colossians right. 2, verse 11. Water baptism, that's a Christian thing, isn't it? Christ has nothing to do with water. No. It was God who became man, who died on the cross and shed his blood to pay for your sins. He rose from the dead so you can have eternal life. That's the best public testimony of salvation, much better than any water baptism. If you want to publicly testify, then do that, right? If you do that when you're water baptized, just live off the water baptism, it'll be even more clear, <laughs> right? If you want a clear public testimony, then speak words. Why are you doing an act to represent you're not doing an act? Mm -hmm. Colossians 2, verse 11. Paul says, in Christ, you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of the flesh. So Paul says, you are circumcised, but not with hands, which means it's not physical, right? 
The circumcision here is one performed by the circumcision of Christ. He cuts off the body of the... And he, by the way, circumcision here is referring to physical circumcision, but says yours is not physical. He's using the religious act to say that you already have what that brings without the physical act. These Gentiles were not circumcised. And then he explains what he means by that. He doesn't keep that secret saying you have it spiritually. It's symbolic, right? He explains. He put off the body of the sins of the flesh. Your sins were put off by Christ's death. Amen. Look at verse 12. Bear with him of baptism. There it is, the physical act. Really? Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith, the operation of God. Who performs this one? The operation of God by faith. People know what water baptism is and what baptism is, but then Paul says he explains it. The operation of God is what baptized you and raised you from the dead. And people take these verses and they say, I'm going to perform this physical act and then explain the spiritual reality. Buried with baptism, you know, I know you lay people, in, you, you inter people into the ground as you are, like you were water baptizing, you put their body flat, horizontal down on the ground. But Christ was not buried in the ground that way. You know that? He was taken off the cross and put into a tomb. He wasn't like put under the dirt. He was put into the tomb. What's that mean? Like, dirt didn't cover his body. A rock did. <laughs> That's a little different. And it definitely wasn't water. So you being buried by water is different than Christ being put into a tomb. But yeah, people die in the water too. They also die in fire. What about cremation? Can that be a symbol of a spiritual reality? Maybe more literal to people who aren't believers, you know? Plus 2.11. Verse 12, Paul explains the reality. He doesn't hide something behind a spiritual symbol or behind a physical symbol. People say, that's just a, just a tradition. <laughs> well, we know it's a Jewish tradition that's mandated by law. We know it's historically a Christian tradition. It's a modern tradition. It's a denominational tradition. But what we're learning is it's without spiritual import, which means it has no spiritual significance to you. And if you're doing something without spiritual significance and yet it's being performed as a sacred act, then you've got to question, why are we doing it? Right? In fact, we talk about water baptism, and we're making the assumption based on Noah Webster that all baptism is into water. And Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize. Amen. But there are many baptisms in the Bible that are not wet. Every reason for making baptismal fonts sacred and baptismal tanks sacred assumes that every baptism mentioned in the Bible is wet. That's why Noah Webster said it's an application of water to a person, but that's not the biblical definition of baptism. You say, Justin, who are you to change definitions? I'm not. I'm reading the Bible. Amen. I'll show you where Jesus himself defines it as not wet. So it can't be that clear. It is. Jesus himself says baptism doesn't mean wet. I'll, I'll show you. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 and 5. This is why I said it's one of the easiest scriptural things to show people, which is why... I don't like talking about it too much. It's like, this is, this is easy stuff, folks. There should not be a problem for a mid-Acts Pauline dispensationalist who rightly divides and a Church of Christ elder because it's like a no-brainer. It's like it's very easy to show from the Scripture. This is true. The hard part is tradition. Ephesians 4, verse 3 through 5. Paul says, To endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, there is one body, one Spirit. You mean two Spirits. Even as you're, no, one spirit, right? And as you're called, what's the Greek say? Who knows Greek in here? One, right? Even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You see that? No, he doesn't say there's only one baptism. He puts one baptism next to one Lord and one faith. Like you can't, like, change a number there unless you change all of them. There's one body, one hope of your calling, one spirit, one God and Father of all, is above all, and through all, and in you all. There's one baptism. Well, sure, yeah. And the Holy Christian Church believes in one baptism that saves you and regenerates you, and the application is by water. Okay? Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2. There's one baptism in Ephesians 4, but there's more than one baptism in the Bible. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2. Hebrews 6, 1, the author says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works of faith toward God. The, the author's saying, I'm going to move on to more advanced things here. Leave off these elementary things. Leave off 
say in verse 2, the doctrine of, what's the word? Baptisms, plural. Right there. The author of Hebrews, who's a Hebrew, writing to Hebrews about Hebrew things, says there's baptisms, plural. Look at Hebrews 9, verse 10. I'm going to go to the Greek here for you guys, just, just so you are impressed by my linguistic ability. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say it out loud? <laughs> Hebrews 9, verse 10. It was in my notes. I didn't. Hebrews 9, verse 10. He said, he's talking about the, the tabernacle and heavenly places and the things that was on earth, and he says, these things stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them, those on Israel in the Old Testament, until the time of Reformation. That's not... Protestant Reformation, by the way. But Hebrews 9, verse 10, he's talking about the Old Testament law, which stood in meats and drinks and diverse washings. See the diverse washings there? You know what the Greek word is for washings right there? Baptismos. <laughs> it's baptisms. A washings is just fine of a word there. It's not an error at all, but just trying to show you that it's more than one baptism. There's washings in the Old Testament. You don't find the word baptism at all in the Old Testament because it's taken from the Greek word, baptism. But it means washings. It means an immersion into something, a complete immersion for the sake of identification. Okay, water could be the thing you're immersed into, which often was the case. Look at 1 Peter 3. It's not the only places, by the way. 1 Peter. I'm showing you a list of places in the Bible where there was more than one baptism. Many of them were dry. Here's an example of a dry baptism. 1 Peter 3, verse 20 and 21. I don't, want, don't, don't get distracted by the details here. Okay, We're talking about baptism. We're talking about it being wet or dry here. Peter is uh, writing to the scattered tribes of Israel in the New Testament. He says, 1 Peter 3, verse 20, he says, uh, Christ went to preach unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when, so he's talking about a historical time in the days of Noah, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Did the flood waters save Noah? The ark saved Noah. Yes? I mean, the flood waters killed everybody. That was the wrath, the pouring out of wrath. In fact, the ark kept them relatively dry relative to everyone else who was drowned, right? So the ark kept them dry. The ark is what saved them. They're being saved by water. It's not about being saved from the drowning of water by the ark that was a preparing, right? Verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. The baptism is not connected here to the flood waters, but to the ark. Do you see this? The baptism was the figure in the ark, not the water. Noah didn't get wet and got saved. He was dry and got saved. Just an example. You say, well, that's kind of a stretch, Justin. Well, maybe. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. That's just one of them. Let's show you another one. It gets better. Don't worry. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I follow Jesus' example. I say the best for last. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 1. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. He's talking about Israel and going through the Red Sea, remember? They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Remember Moses who led Israel through the wilderness by the cloud and then through the sea because Moses parted the waters? Have you seen the movies, right? The waters parted. When they went across, I was telling Tim this the other day, my son, they went across on dry ground. In Exodus, on dry land. They didn't slosh through the swamps. They didn't have to swim across. Dry land. And it says they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And people read the word sea and they go, ah, water. Water's around. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like not on them. This is a dry baptism, folks. They're baptized unto Moses. They're immersed unto Moses to be identified with the following of Moses, God's Savior to them. Not into water. They were in the middle of the water without getting wet. That's what's going on there. Look at Matthew 3. I'm not trying to stretch, folks. If those are the only two passages I had about water baptism, of course, you know. Verse 21, 17, Christ sent Paul not to baptize. Look at Matthew 3. Matthew 3, 11. This is John the Baptist. 
the one, the only one named in the Bible Baptist because he water baptized. He wasn't the only one that water baptized in the Bible. He wasn't the only one historically that water baptized. Every priest, which John was one, would water baptize people. John the Baptist baptizing people was not the unique thing. It was where he was baptizing and why he was baptizing. He was baptizing in the River Jordan. You say, well, isn't, isn't that where they were baptized back then when they didn't have fancy mikvahs? No, they actually had fancy mikvahs. They had fancy baptismal pools. That's why the priests went out to him and said, why are you doing this out here? Because they actually just dug up in Jerusalem something that looked like the Pool of Siloam. You heard of that pool? It was like a mikvah pool around the temple in Jerusalem because that's what they did. They had baptismal pools around the temple where they'd go and perform their baptisms. And here goes John out to the wilderness, to the river, without all man's corrupted construction, it says, out here in the river. Remember he had the weird clothing too? And they came out and said, why are you doing this out here, John? Why? Because he was telling them something. Yeah. What you guys are doing is corrupt. Mm -hmm. I'm calling them into repentance. Yeah. And Matthew 3, look what John the Baptist said about baptisms. Learn a couple things in this verse. John says, I indeed baptize you with water. Now, if baptism meant water, he wouldn't have to say, I baptize you with water. Right? Baptism doesn't mean water. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. That keeps coming up, baptism unto. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, this of course is Jesus, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He, Jesus, shall baptize you with what? Holy Ghost, which is not water, and fire, which is definitely not water. There, how many baptisms are in that verse? There are three baptisms in that verse, at least two if you want to squeeze the other two together, but not just one, that's for sure. And two of them aren't wet. This is not even Paul. I'm simply trying to show you that baptism doesn't mean wet. You can't assume every verse in the Bible says baptism is wet. But every reason for making baptismal fonts and tanks sacred is assuming that every mention of the word baptism is wet. That's a big assumption to make, folks, based on these verses. Look at Acts 11, 16. Acts 11, 16. Peter acknowledges John's statement in Matthew 3, in Acts 11, verse 16. Peter goes to a Gentile, forced to go there by the Holy Ghost. And Cornelius, after he starts preaching Jesus to him, starts speaking in tongues with the Holy Ghost. Now remember, Peter's formula was, repent and be baptized, then receive the Holy Ghost. You can't receive the sanctified Holy Ghost without being water baptized first. But Cornelius, he got the Holy Ghost without being water baptized. And so when Peter thinks about this for a little bit, he goes back to Jerusalem and tells the people there, he says, verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, Peter, genius. How that John said, how the Lord said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with Water again. The Holy Ghost. Now what is Peter recognizing? There was water baptism, but Jesus said he will baptize with not water. You can be baptized without water? Yes, you can. Amen. Peter recognized it. That's not even Paul. That's why I told you this is simple. This is slam dunk biblical exegesis, folks, because not every baptism is wet. How do you know Every baptism in the Bible is wet because you want it to be. There are many baptisms that are dry. In fact, half the baptisms of the Bible are dry. Amen. We're making a small list for you right here. Matthew 22, Jesus, I told you I'd tell you where Jesus said they're not all wet. Look at Matthew 22. Now, Jesus was water baptized. You know the story there, hopefully, from Sunday school or something. We've covered it here before. That Jesus was water baptized by John to fulfill all righteousness and People want to say they followed Jesus in water baptism, but Jesus never instructed you to do what he did because he was baptized without sin. Amen. And that's, that's not how you were, if you were. Jesus said to fulfill righteousness. You, if you do have to fulfill righteousness, you're denying the righteousness of God in Christ is what you're doing. But Matthew chapter 20, verse 22, after he's water baptized, much later, in fact, years later, Matthew 20, 22, the disciples are asking, him, who's going to be on his right hand, who's going to be on his left hand. He, and here comes the mother of the Zebedee children. <laughs> and she says, grant my two sons this privilege. Mama's boys, right? <clears throat> and Jesus answers and says, ye know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? 
and to be, future tense, baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. And they said, we are able. They were already water baptized, folks. He's not talking about another water baptism. He says, ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. In Luke 12, 50, uh, 12, 50, he even says, I have a baptism to be baptized with and I am straightened till it be accomplished. He's talking about his death. By the way, everyone concedes to that. Even Noah Webster, Noah Webster, definition number two under baptism of Noah Webster says the sufferings of Christ. Remember the first one said water applied to a person? The second one says the sufferings of Christ. Oh, so Noah Webster, <laughs> baptism is not only water. You see, it's not that hard to see. No Webster even saw it. Then why does everyone think baptism is water? Because everything they see in every church about baptism is water. Yeah. Unless you're Pentecostal, then you got the Holy Ghost one. Right? And so, Paul's the only one who teaches baptism into Christ. Galatians 3.21 says, if you be baptized, you're in Christ. Galatians 3.27 as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Amen. I baptize you with water. I baptize you into water. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Paul says the Spirit baptizes you into Christ. A lot of baptisms here. And Paul says if you're baptized, you're baptized into Christ. You have put on Christ. Romans 6, he says, if you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into his death and resurrection. Paul defines the baptism in Romans 6, 3, and 4. And it's not a symbolic reality of a physical act. It's Christ's death baptism that Christ said, I'm going to die. I'm calling that a baptism, a total immersion into the death of humanity. And I'm going to do it to take upon the sins of the world to myself, to die for all men's sins, and then I might rise from the dead to put on life. And then I'm going to have people trust me. And Paul says, we're baptized into that. I would much rather be totally immersed for identification into Christ and his death and resurrection than to any pool of water or any font anywhere, especially since I'm not under the laws of baptism, and Christ is what makes me complete. You see, the one baptism that Paul spoke about for the body of Christ in Ephesians 4, into the body of Christ, does not require a baptistry. The Spirit baptizes you into Christ when you believe the gospel. You're in Galatians, Galatians 3, 1 and 2. Paul even says, Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. You know Jesus Christ crucified. This only what I learn of you. If you know Christ crucified, did you receive the Spirit by water baptism? No, he says the works of the law. Doesn't that include water baptism? We already said it did in the Old Testament. Or by the hearing of faith. Did you receive the Spirit by faith or by water baptism? Ask Cornelius that in Acts 10. It's by faith. Right? Did you receive the Spirit, the seal of your inheritance in Ephesians 1 verse 13, when you believed the gospel in Ephesians 1 13, or was it after you were water baptized and did the works of the law? Paul says, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You see, our baptism to Christ requires faith and spirit, not flesh and works. Amen. But the only thing you can put into water is your flesh. And the only thing you can call that is your work. Right? So Paul's baptism is very clear. It's not your work or it's not your flesh. Baptism, then, is not defined as application of water to a person, but rather, as everyone else describes it, a complete immersion into something Water is not the necessary component for the purpose of identifying you with that thing. That's the idea. Okay. The Jews were totally immersed in their waters for ritual purity and conversion. Look at Acts 18. So we finish up here. Acts 18. Your baptism, folks, and don't mistake, you are baptized. You have one baptism. It doesn't require water. The Spirit did it for you. And thank God for that because it, you'd probably mess it up if you did. Acts 18, verse 25. Your baptism speaks to what you know. You can testify that in your own life. How many times were you baptized? You say, well, I don't know, half a dozen times. Well, you can look back at each one of those, and it testifies to what you do or what you didn't know, right? You did it for a reason, didn't you? Or was forced on you by a reason. Acts 18, 25. Paul says there was a certain Jew named Apollos. He was eloquent 
an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, verse 26, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Now, water baptism is a work. John performed water baptism, performed it. But see what it said there, knowing? That's because you don't just do a water baptism. You do it for a purpose. You do it unto a thing. You're water baptized in the River Jordan unto repentance. And thus you have to know repentance, which is why John the Baptist warned the Pharisees that they didn't have repentance, they couldn't be water baptized. That was their hypocrisy. This guy knew John's baptism, baptism of repentance, but he didn't know anything else. Thus, he wasn't baptized unto Jesus. He didn't know Jesus. He just knew John's information. Your baptism reflects what you know. If you're water baptized, it's because you've been told to do water baptism under instruction from the Lord in a previous dispensation that's ignorant of what Christ has now told us not to do and to do. Amen? I just justified all your water baptisms. Yeah, oh, praise God. I was just ignorant. Yes. <laughs> Because when you believe the gospel of Christ, you're saved in the spirit, baptizing you in the body. Amen. He did it already. Yeah. I'll never forget. A young woman came up to me and said she wanted to be water baptized. And I said, where did you hear that? I've never told you you have to be water baptized. And she said, I know people at the other church, when they wanted to join their church, they were baptized. The young girl, I was like, how did you learn this? They learned it from people telling them. Yeah. And I had to explain, look, you don't have to be water baptized to join the church. When you, do you believe the gospel? We went through the gospel, and she agreed. And I said, you are already baptized into Christ by the Spirit. Amen. She had never heard that, never told that. All she knew is that you follow every, all, their, all her friends who are getting water baptized because it's what you do to join the church. And she wanted to. Like, she was sincere. She wanted to. Misinformed. Why? By the physical act that hid the symbolic reality. Right? By tradition, not scripturally informed, rightly divided. Acts 18.25. Your baptism speaks to what you know. Ephesians 4, 5, Paul says there's one baptism. Right? It's not water. Look at Acts 19. I know I'm going to a crazy place here at the end, but I'm not trying to cause controversy here. I want to show you the point, though. The most important thing you can ask about baptism is unto what were you baptized? When you say, are you a Christian? Someone says, I was baptized. You say, unto what were you baptized? That's the question you should ask. Yes. I, I was baptized, too. By the Spirit and the Christ. I've never been water baptized, but I was baptized by the Spirit and the Christ. Look at Acts 19. Look how Paul deals with this in verse 2. He says, he met some, some disciples in the upper coast of Ephesus, and he says unto them in verse 2, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They didn't even know about it. And then he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? Now remember before, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but he that comes after me is baptized you with the Holy Ghost. And Peter meets these guys who were already disciples. They already knew about repentance and John, right? And maybe even Jesus. And he says, do you have the Holy Ghost? And they go, I don't know what you're talking about. You go to someone and say, are you a Christian? Have you heard about the cross? And they go, I don't know what you're talking about, cross. And you go, what did you hear? <laughs> like, what are you believing? Unto what were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. Oh. It had nothing to do with the performance, folks. Paul immediately knew what they did not know. Yeah. Because when you, water, when you baptize, you're baptizing, you're immersing someone into something. They're actually dedicating themselves, converting themselves to a belief, to a principle, to a way, whatever it calls, calls it, right? You're identified with something. And John said, call them into the wilderness, baptism unto repentance. Jesus called them to believe that he was the son of God. Peter said, repent in the name of Jesus Christ, resurrected, and receive the Holy Ghost. Paul said, believe Christ crucified and be saved without your works. You see, it reflects your understanding. And after Paul knew they knew John's baptism, he went on to articulate, you know, John spoke of Jesus, and then Jesus sent the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is what now fills people. And, and then Paul lays hands on them, and they receive the Holy Ghost. My point isn't what happened with the Holy Ghost in the tongues. My point is the baptism part Paul asked, unto what were you baptized? It's not simply an act, folks. There's an understanding that accompanies it, and that Christians don't understand what baptism communicates, communicates their confusion. Because the Bible's not that unclear about it. Paul says you're baptized into Christ's body. If you know the gospel preaching of the cross, the gospel of the grace of God, then your baptism doesn't require water. Amen. It's dry. 
Our baptism is into one body by the cross. Look at 1 Corinthians 1. It's into one body by the cross upon belief in Jesus Christ. There was a controversy in the church of Corinth about water baptism because many people were being water baptized by people, different ones. And in verse 13, Paul says, verse 12, he says, that every one of you says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and I have Christ. Because they were all water baptized unto different teachers. The teachings of Christ, the teachings of Apollos, the teachings of Peter, the teachings of Paul. Now by Christ there, they're not referring to the biblical whole sense of the Bible. They're talking about Christ's earthly ministry. And Paul says this, is Christ divided? What's the answer to that question? No. Who teaches that? Paul. There's one body of Christ. Was Paul crucified for you? Who teaches that? Well, Paul wasn't crucified for you. Jesus was crucified for you. So there's one body, Christ crucified. What's he say? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, in the name of Jesus, right? So there's one body that in the name of Jesus Christ you believe was crucified for you. That's what Paul's explaining here. If you're, water, if you're baptized, it's unto Jesus as the Son of God, Christ, who was crucified for you and made into one body. That's what Paul's explaining. If any of you are baptized, that's the baptism you're baptized with. It has nothing to do with who did what. In fact, verse 14, Paul says, I thank God that I baptized, what baptized? None of you, but Crispus and Gaius. Now, just count with me on one hand, because it's all it takes. How many people Paul water baptized? Crispus and Gaius. Lest any man should say, I had baptized in mine own name. Paul is preaching Jesus Christ, his crucifixion, into one body. That was the baptism he was preaching by the Spirit. That's what he says 11 chapters later. Christmas and Gaius, he water baptized. Lest any should say, I baptized in mine own name. And, oh, and I also baptize the household of Stephanus. How big is your household? Let's take the biggest house in the room. I don't know. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. That's all I got. How big was that church in Corinth? Let's say the household of Stephanus included his cousins. Okay. We got 15 people here? There are people here this morning than Paul water baptized in Corinth. Paul was there for nearly two years. He could only remember half a, do a dozen people. He wasn't water baptizing people unto salvation. He wasn't doing it for remission of sins. Amen. And he even says here, you're baptized into one body because of Christ crucified in the name of Jesus Christ. He says again in chapter 12, Christ sent me not to baptize, but preach the gospel. That's why he didn't do it to everybody. If he sent him for salvation, he would do it just like John. Line them up, boys. Come on. I baptized all of you. I remember. I do it everywhere I go. He didn't say that. Right? Our identification, his baptism is a complete immersion for identification, which is what it is. Our identification is with Christ. When Paul says you're complete in Christ, he means you don't need to be immersed into anything else. Amen. You need Christ, him crucified, that's it. You're risen with him. You're crucified with him. You're in him. Our baptism, that baptism, is what saves. That's what purifies. That's what identifies you as the church. And no water is required for that one. Okay? Any questions or comments?